Johannesburg form again. I mean, we saw Tony Nasser bring one here with chloroform. No chloroform. Yeah, no form. Chloroform. <laughs> and, uh, and at once. So you've got to respect that uh, Johannesburg form. I don't care what anybody says. They are definitely superior than us. Uh, the horse. Awesome. Broadcasting live from the Capital OTB Studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning and welcome to Racing Across America on this Sunday morning. Seth Merrow and Sully Karate. Sully, good morning. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Very good. After a big day of racing down at Gulfstream. And of course, you want to thank them for their sponsorship, Gulfstream Park Champions start here also want to remind you that here uh, today at the clubhouse race book $100 winter bet promotion so uh, you want to watch all the racing maybe have lunch at the restaurant sit at the bar and just enjoy racing with uh, a group of like-minded people cheering throughout the afternoon and also have a chance at that $100 winter bet contest swing on down to the clubhouse race book 711 central avenue and Albany. nice crowd in here uh, yesterday for uh, the Saturday action and got an early start. They also got uh, to see Syracuse win on the screen at the end of the, uh, <laughs> the, end of the, the hall there uh, with uh, a win over Wake Forest. 19 wins, I think. Put a couple more in the books, they're guaranteed to be in, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, you would definitely think they're going to be in. They've been playing well, even though they lost to Duke in Carolina. They played them well, and, you know, I, th I think a win at Duke, they're, you know, they're going to yeah, be yeah. in with 10 ACC wins. I think they're, they're, they'll be in on uh I think it's next two Sundays from now, yeah. Selection Sunday. St. Patrick's Day, I believe, is Selection Sunday. So I think Syracuse will have their name called. We're in March, and March Madness right around the corner. Also, a, a tip of the cap, I should mention, uh, I'm a Syracuse guy, so I concentrate on Syracuse through most of the season, but obviously living in this area and just listening to radio and whatnot, Siena's having a spectacular yeah. year, really. <laughs> uh, new coach has kind of turned it around. And they lost, uh, was it Friday? I think they lost to Canisius. But before that game, that league was crazy. I haven't seen the standings now, but I know about the middle of the week I heard it was about six teams that were yeah. within a game yeah. of either being first or sixth. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah. again, hats off to Siena. It'll be fun to watch them uh, if they make a postseason tournament. Certainly, I'll, uh, if they play locally, I'll swing down and watch yeah. a game. I, I think the MAC, tur the MAC tournament, if they're the top four, they're going to get a double bye. So that's kind of what you're hoping for, especially they're going to be yeah. home as well at the Times Union Center. So uh, they are having a really, really nice year, and they're young. So hopefully that success continues for the next couple of years. Yeah, it's uh, certainly, as I say, a nice little turnaround for them, unexpected. So uh, congratulations, as I say, to Siena. And and uh, good luck going forward. Love to see them get that double buy. And uh, that, man, if they made the big tournament, yeah, that would be incredible. Be awesome. But as I say, I think uh, they stand a chance at uh, postseason regardless. If they if they win their regular season, that's what I was hearing on the radio the other day, they get guaranteed an NAT uh, berth. And as I said again, uh, there's a group of them that are, you know, just so you got to have a little luck through the, the last uh, swing of the season. So, uh all right, again, uh, nice racing yesterday at Gulfstream, so we're going to do a little uh, recap of some of their stakes towards the end of the program. We will be joined by Mike Welch from the Daily Racing Forum. Mike, of course, covers Gulfstream uh, for the Racing Forum, so he was obviously there yesterday. We'll get some of his thoughts uh, on some of the races, uh, including uh, some of the upsets. Fountain of Youth, Devona Dale, which was an eye-popping upset. Sully and I will take a look at some of the other stakes races that were on the card yesterday um, at Gulfstream. But we wanted to uh, show one that was Friday night here, Saturday afternoon down in Australia. We've talked about uh, Winks a number of times, but she's just phenomenal. And again, given that it's Australia, it's these days it's easy to see these international races, but given that the timing uh, and being in the middle of the night, you have to kind of go look them up. And so for folks who didn't, I just wanted to show Winks again, who broke a world record 
on Friday night our time. She was in the grade one Chipping Norton. Um, and being a grade one race and getting the win, it was her 23rd group one win, which was a world record. More uh, incredibly, her 31st straight victory. Um, she's eight years old, she's won four Cox Plates, and again, that's one of, if not uh, the top race down there for, for the older horses, and she's won it four times. A couple more races in the career, the March 23rd uh, grade one George Ryder, the April 13th grade one Queen Elizabeth, so it'll be fun to see <clears throat> what she can do in the remainder of the career. Eight years old, Winks. I'm going to show uh, that chipping north and we'll show the entire race and you'll hear the call. Winks is going to be the number five horse. You'll see her, see her settle in. Oh, uh, maybe I, I was going to say about half half pack, but she's maybe top third. You'll, you'll pick her out. Uh, you'll be, see the saddle cloth, but there's also chicklets. She's the number five horse. Happy Clapper opens up and I tell you, as they turn for the stretch, uh, the, the announcer remarks about the crowd uh, being on the edge of their seats. And uh, Winks had to work a little bit, but when uh, when the jock sets her down, she she gets it done. And uh, and that's what the jockey said after the race. Yeah, you know, once she saw the target and did it, I didn't have to do too much work. She just did it on her own for the most part. But I tell you, at the top of the stretch, you, you think, yeah, this is going to be a little bit difficult. So uh, coming up next. The Chipping North, again, Friday night our time, Saturday afternoon down in Australia. 31st straight win for the incredible eight-year-old Mayor Winks and the 23rd grade one of her career. Up next, Chipping North. Coming back up into the gates now. Red light is on. Ready now for the Chipping Norton. Set. And they're racing. And Happy Clapper jumped out well. She's jumped okay, Winks, but Happy Clapper's going to lead. From Unforgotten, Eggtart goes forward and Winks will settle in fourth and stay off the fence. A length further back to Patrick Erina, then came Librana, and Brimham Rocks is the last one. Oh, this has never happened in his career, but he didn't have much choice. Happy Clubber, he's never led in his life, but at the 1,200 metres, he's two lengths clear from Eggtart. Two further back to Unforgotten, three quarters the outside to Winks seeing plenty of daylight. Two further back to Patrick Erina, then Librana, and Brimham Rocks is last of all. So Happy Clapper establishing a sizable lead coming down the side of the court. He's been trying to beat the great mayor for the last three years. He's never led. What will happen from here? Happy Clapper extends four lengths in front now of Eggtart. Two further back to Winks, taking closer order. Unforgotten lost a spot as Happy Clapper goes further in front. Good gap back to Patrick and Librana and Brigham Rocks. This has got the crowd on the edge of their seats. Happy Clapper's five in front to Egg Tart. Now Bowman just starting to feel for Winks coming around the turn. He doesn't want to get too far away. Happy Clapper comes up the rise, four lengths clear. But Winks, she's really starting to hit top gear now. Two lengths away. Happy Clapper under the whip. Two in front. Bowman says, come on! One girl, Winks, moves up on the outside of Happy Clapper. It's a race today, but no longer. She starts to draw clear for a world record of 23 Group 1s. Winks by two lengths to Happy Clapper. He made it exciting. Unforgotten third. Then Egg Libran, Patrick Aaron, Brimham Rocks. Oh. Uh, incredible. Eight years old. Uh, again, 23rd Group one grade one uh, and uh, uh, 31st consecutive victory uh, in the Chipping Norton yesterday or Friday night our time at uh, Randwick and, and Sully uh, Dan from the control room and I were talking yesterday um, you know a lot of times great race Phillies mayors get to a point where they just kind of lose interest in the game a little bit. She's eight years old, clearly has not lost interest because at the top of the stretch, she had some work to do, but then yeah. wins kind of drawing away with ease. It's just incredible. It, it really is. And, <clears throat> excuse me, she really did have to work. And, you know, I already knew the result, and I still was surprised that she got stretch, by yeah. everybody. I don't know how she caught Happy Clapper there. And as you said, the announcer said, this is going to have everyone on their head to their <laughs> seats. So, you know, congratulations to her. She's always fun to watch and going to be, it's going to, 
continue to be fun to watch uh, as her career goes on. And as you said, eight years old, we don't have much of these races left. So uh, she keeps breaking records and extending her, her own records, uh, which is just really fun to see and cool for the sport. Yeah, a cu couple more. As I said, March 23rd and April 13th, we'll see what she can do, if she can continue to uh, add to that resume. You know, it, as I say, 23 grade ones. How many top class horses don't even race 23 <laughs> times, much less 23 grade ones? Yikes. All right, let's uh, jump into uh, some of the stakes action from uh, yesterday, and uh, we'll kick things off taking a look at the Gulfstream Park Sprint. Um, I liked recruiting ready. I think most people liked recruiting ready, as evidenced by the one to two price. It just looked like he had a little bit of an edge on this bunch. Now, the most likely contender to me <clears throat> was Quixote. If that horse could get back to the, the performance in the Sunshine Million Sprint, where he uh, popped a triple digit buyer. But that was a little bit of an aberration. So it was a question mark, would Coyote get back to that? Coyote ran well yesterday, but recruiting ready, uh, clearly best. Again, the one to two favorite, chart margin of three and a quarter. Recruiting ready is going to be the number one horse. Coyote, the number four. Uh, sweet on the ladies, uh, number six, runs third at 16 to one. But again, you can see as they come into the stretch, the two logicals, uh, Coyote was the five to two second choice. Uh, are dueling it out, but recruiting ready, as I say, pulls away. Chart margin over three lengths. Uh, again, he was kind of obvious, got it done the way a one to two shot should. Yeah, and, you know, just looking at that race, it was going to be very, very tough to beat recruiting ready, especially in the sprint race. The one horse that I thought had a little bit of a shot there just because the horse ran in the previous starts, including against Colfront. We saw how impressive Colfront was on President's Day. Was the eight who really didn't break well with Robbie Alvarado. Uh, Storm Advisory usually gets near the front of the pack and just never broke well, never got towards the front. And so I kind of knew it was, it was going to be very tough to beat recruiting ready, especially on the front end. But as you said, Quixote ran a really incredible race, I thought, uh, last time out. And then, you know, it's gonna, it was going to be tough to win two in a row, especially with a horse uh, like recruiting ready. So, uh, big day for Luis Ayas as well, coming yeah. back from his little suspension there. He had a really big day, including, uh, we'll, we're going to talk about it later, a 50 to 1 shot. And you don't see that very often with one of the leading jockeys down there getting a 50 to 1 winner in a stakes race. Uh, recruiting ready, again, uh, logical and gets it done the way a 1 2 shot should. <clears throat> the very one. Uh, these are Phillies and Mayors going a mile and three sixteenth on the grass in a grade three event. Uh, top of my page, I had it written. Uh, this was a competitive race. I had Holy Helena down in the fourth spot, actually. But boy, she's gutsy and, and just I, I, I've always appreciated her and how gutsy she is, and it seems like she's done very well since Jimmy Jerkins transferred to the grass. She was the winner in 2017 of the Queen's Plate over the boys, subsequently came down and, and flopped, however, in the Alabama. But again, then they eventually went to the grass, and she's done very well, and she's kind of gutsy and, and outperforms what you expect, I think. And that, to me, is what happened uh, yesterday. Although I say that, that was in my opinion. Betting public made her the two-to-one choice. But I will say she has to run down Icky Macho, uh, the number six horse, Jose Ortiz on board, the rank outsider at 24 to 1. Uh, Icky Macho is again the number six, Holy Helena the number three, and the, that rank outsider does not make it easy for Holy Helena, but eventually Irod Ortiz gets the favorite up. Semper Cientia, uh, the horse that I liked at 7 to 2, runs third, the number four horse. Um, but a nice performance from the Jimmy Jerkins trainee, Holy Helena, in here. Yeah, I, I was with you there. I liked the four in that spot. I didn't think it was a bad race at all. And, you know, Holy Helena, I was with you. I tried to beat the horse a little bit. And when the pool opened up, the, the one, Dancelin, was actually the Shug McGahey trainee, was the favorite at 5-2. to two, And Holy Helena was at 7-2, to two, just for a brief moment, not for a, a, a long time. But it was interesting to see Holy Helena did not open up as the favorite. Eventually did go off as the favorite there. But... Um, on the front end, Roger Atfield, and, he, and we talked to him when we go visit um, up at Woodbine. He's a really nice trainer, and this is a horse that came in 
a couple starts back from Woodbine, got to the lead. Didn't, I didn't think ran bad at all up in Toronto, so uh, I would have been kicking myself if I didn't have a Roger Atfield horse in my on my ticket anywhere because that horse paid well. And you had Jose Ortiz who does a great job on the front end on turf on turf routes, but Holy Helena definitely got the job done. Uh, and I read had to go buy his brother, and his brother was at yeah. a big price looking to kind of blow some race, uh, some mid pick four tickets. Yeah, up. another one of those that that we've seen down at uh, Gulfstream this season. The uh, uh, Ortiz brothers exact uh, and what did we get for a buck? He got forty six dollars put in the uh, Ortiz. But Icky Macho, I mean, tossed in a, a clunker on the move from Woodbine to Gulfstream last time in the La Proviante. But do note, it was the first time Lasix. I guess you could have circled that and taken a shot, as you said, with an Atfield horse who had done well uh, up at uh, Woodbine, and you were looking at a price in one of the Ortiz brothers. So there were some things I guess you could have circled and thought, man, let me find some value in there. Yeah, that you know. Personally, I didn't have the horse. At I didn't all either because I thought there was more speed on paper. No one really ran with the number six at all. So, um, but I definitely would have been kicking myself if Roger Atfield knocked me out of a mid pick four. Yeah, I was uh, uh, reverse engineering there for for next time. Maybe you got to pay attention, I suppose, to the, maybe that first time lace. And you know, you look up twenty four to one. Eh, maybe this horse can turn around if you're looking for a little bit of value. Uh, there were some things you could have checked off there. I, as I say, I didn't, but uh, you could have for uh, next time, certainly. The, uh, here Comes the Bride. We'll take a look at that one as well. The Here Comes the Bride for the three-year-old fillies on the turf. Grade 3 event, mile and a 16th on the grass. Um, I, I was kind of surprised at the odds on the Chad horses. Uh, Cambier Park uh, winds up to be the uh, four to five favorite, and that one will win. But Golconda and Connectivity, the six and the eight, um, Connectivity at four to one, Golconda at nine to one, two other Chad horses. I put Connectivity on top. Betting public was right, though, get, letting those get away at a little bit of a price. They wound up sixth and seventh. Cambier Park, uh, the seven horse from Chad, wins as the favorite. But Princessa Carolina, the number five horse, uh, we had talked to Kenny McPeak. He said, ah, I'm going to try for some black type, and if this one doesn't run well, we'll go back to allowance company. But uh, you have to think they'll stick in stakes with Princess of Carolina. She ran very nicely to get up and run second at uh, 21 to 1. So with the 4 to 5 favorite on top and the Kenny McPeak trainee running second, you wound up with an okay uh, exact in there. Again, it was a $3.60 winner, but for a buck, you got $34 back uh, on the exact. So hopefully, some folks uh, listen to Kenny. Uh, yesterday on Racing Across America and maybe threw that one in the mix. Bell Laura in the third spot at 8-1. to one. And as, it, as I say, disappointing from the other two Chad runners. I thought they were both live, but they wound up 6th and 7th in the field of 8. I, I thought Connectivity was a very interesting horse uh, coming into that race. I had right in the top of my mix, and as you said, just a little bit disappointing there. Really never got anything running, but going to be interesting to see how both of those Chad runners, especially Connectivity, uh, giving the, the connections of Klarevich, and then you know, obviously you have Irad and, and Chad there. It's going to be interesting to see how that one does next time out. And you, most likely we'll get a decent little price because of that performance here today. So, um, but I agree. I, th I thought the Princess Carolina uh, ran a really, really nice race. And I had fourth in my mix. I did not think it'd get up to run second. But then again, if you listen to uh, our Racing Across America yesterday, um, that's a really nice runner for Kenny McPeak. So I thought the best of the three Chads won. Uh, but again, I, was, I agree. I was just a little bit disappointed by the bottom two runners in this race. Uh, let's move on to the Honey Fox uh, a little bit later in the card. And um, I'm looking here. I got my not, my, uh, my not, oh, there we go. I was out of order with my, uh, the Honey Fox, uh, grade three event, $150,000 mile on the grass for Phillies and Mayors. And, uh, Pursuce was the, the horse that looked kind of logical. I had it on top. Uh, handicappers report yesterday. Brian Addo, who looks at uh, Gulfstream and puts the matrix together for the uh, one sheet every day, uh, was singling this on the Rainbow Six ticket he was putting together, and that's the way it played out. Pursuce, the number one. Chad Brown trainee that won the French Oaks a couple of seasons back. The... Uh, uh, North American debut at Saratoga was pretty good. Had been off since then, but you have to figure Chad's going to have that one ready. Does get it done. Number one, Pursuce wins as the even money favorite. Valedictorian, uh, the two horse. Nice second at six to one. Bella Vey, 
Bellavace, the uh, nine horse, runs third. I had that one right underneath. Um, I didn't quite see Valedictorian, but that was a nice uh, run from that one to get up and get into the exact uh, Bellavace I had underneath. And it was a nice third from uh, that one. But Peter Brandt and Chad Brown uh, look to have a, a fun year with a uh, five year old mayor pursues on the turf. Yeah, I, I, you know, we haven't seen this horse since Saratoga and the Little Rose lost to Uni that day, and they were both. Uni, I think, was six wide, uh, and Preseus was five wide. So, and they kind of got in a ding dong battle on the way uh, down the stretch at Saratoga. So, and we saw what Uni was able to do, uh, beating some really nice horses uh, out in California, including Daddy's a Legend in Basilica, a 14 horse field. Uh, and Uni was able to win that race at five to one. So, on, on the morning line, you got seven to two. And, you know, everyone looking at the horse knew seven to two was not going to hold. Uh, but the best horse on paper did win. Valedictorian came into that race after a win last time out. You got a fair price there. I thought it was a very credible ride by Tyler Gaffleyon uh, and a really gutsy ride. The horse was six to one and almost pulled the upset. But the best horse coming into the race off the layoff, uh, Chad. Probably one of, if not the best, off the layoff uh, entering these horses. So uh, I thought the best horse on paper did win. I knew the morning line wouldn't hold, but Valedictorian, I thought, uh, could be a key play in, in this race and turn out to be. So um, congratulations to Chad again. You know, every big card you, you have a Chad, even money running huge. Uh, on the turf, and that's what happened again yesterday. Yeah, as you say, when I first got into the game, layoffs like that, you al almost automatically wrote them off. Now trainers, like, you know, they don't like to waste a bullet, but Chad's one of the best yeah, off the layoff like that. You don't, you, uh, as I say, when, in the old days, you used to write off a horse that had been away since Saratoga and was coming back to the beginning of March, but nowadays not so much. But Chad, certainly, you know, yeah. it, it's not a concern at all, really, a layoff like that. The McDermott, uh, uh, a little bit later on the card, actually wound things up. What was the actual post time? 617 last evening, the McDermott. Uh, um, I, you know, this race to me was kind of competitive and, and fun looking, and I was surprised that uh, Zulu Alpha was going off as short as um, he was, uh, but at a just about even money, a dollar ten to a dollar. Zulu Alpha, a nice late run to get up and get it done from my Rod Ortiz, and we talked about the Roger Atfield uh, Woodbine runner running well. Well, in this race, Melmich, uh, who has had a, a pretty nice career up at Woodbine for Kevin Attard, comes in second here at 13 to 1. 44 to 1, Cullen Rock runs third. As I say, I thought it was a competitive race. Channel Maker in the number 11 runs fourth as the 2 to 1 second choice. Underneath, it did turn out to be competitive. But up front, the betting public nailed it. They made Zulu Alpha a short price, and under Irod Ortiz gets it done now uh, to have a, a two-race win streak going as this one won the, the uh, McKnight back on uh, January 26th. So a nice little uh, winter season down at Gulfstream so far for the Michael Maker trainee. You know, I, I, during the stakes preview, I actually liked Zulu Alpha, and I did not think this horse would go off as the favorite. I I, I did think that Channel Maker would, and or even the favorite, it, it, would even it be money. that short. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it was um, a more competitive race. It looked like, but the betting public nailed it. it. It definitely was, and Channel Maker ran great against Glorious Empire twice, who went down the golf stream and wired um, early in the meet in a Grade Two event, and, and looked pretty impressive there. And this horse. Uh, that, uh, was in a dead heat with Glorious Empire at Saratoga, came back on Travers Day and lost by a length to Glorious Empire. So just looking at that, you know, I, I thought it was a deserving favorite on the morning line, but I did like Zulu Alpha, but at even money, I, you know, I did not think that would happen. But Melmich ran extremely well. I knew a couple of people who liked Melmich uh, and just honestly had a perfect race, followed Zulu Alpha all the whole way around the track, just uh, got up to run second though. But a really nice trifecta there if you, um, if you like the, the Woodbine Chippers, I know a lot of people play them down at Gulfstream. You got a nice exact and a really nice triple, 182 bucks for 50 cents. But uh, Channel Maker, I thought, I, was a little short on the morning line, but if you like the horse, you got a way better price with all the attention going to Zulu Alpha. But uh, a nice win there by Irad Ortiz, who just continues his dominant meet down in South Florida. And again, just kind of showing the betting public kind of keys on the, the buyers and that, you know, the horse goes off again at a short price. There's a string of triple digits in the last four starts. So that's, I'm sure, what people were keying on. Um, and again, I wouldn't expect it to, to, to be much more than that, that even money, but it looked like, again, in a field that looked a little bit competitive, eight to five, nine to five, uh, a little more. But I will note Cullen Rock, the third place finisher at 44 to one was the other Mike Maker horse, uh, the longer half of an uncoupled entry, and it was also 
the other Ortiz brother. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that helped juice up that nice try uh, as well. All right. Uh, I w oh, I wanted to mention one more. Uh, probably should have pulled up the replay, but uh, I didn't. So you can go look it up uh, yourself. But, boy, yesterday at Oaklawn, as I was in here, uh, actually it, it was just after I – no, it was, it, it was during the, the – uh, the uh, OTB Live yesterday afternoon. It was the 7th. It was just as I was getting ready to kind of wrap up. There was an optional claimer uh, with a C condition. Um, $88,000 purse, though, uh, yesterday at Oaklawn, the 7th race at Oaklawn. Could have been a stakes race. I mean, you looked at the field. They had another $12,000 to the purse and give it a name. You wouldn't argue it at all. But I just wanted to mention Matole for uh, Steve Asmussen, who looked so spectacular about this time of year last year. Nice string of... Uh, Sprint wins at uh, Oaklawn and then won the Chick Lang at Pimlico on May 19th last year and went to the sidelines after that. But came into this one with a couple of bullets at the fairgrounds for Steve Asmussen. They picked this spot for the seasonal debut. Matoli looked great yesterday in that uh, race at Oaklawn. Again, look up the seventh race at Oaklawn. Matoli will be a player in that sprint, sprint division uh, this year. I don't know if you had a chance to see that. I but did. Look, look, I did. Look, yeah, yeah, totally, was, that, that was some performance there. And now that this, it looks like the sprint division is going to get very, very competitive yeah. soon. He's, he's clearly going to be a, a solid player now as a four-year-old because that was a good – I mean, Asmussen found a nice spot for him and, and got it done yesterday. Again, in, a, in an interesting field with some bona fide stakes-quality sprinters, you know, maybe not at the top level, but it, this was not – Wilbo's a nice horse, Bourbon Cowboy – uh, a nice horse. Uh, there was a few in there that, that made this uh, a very competitive spot to come back, but uh, Matoli gets it done. Again, watch for that one uh, as the sprint season continues. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll do a little handicapping again a little bit later on. Mike Welch will join us from the Daily Racing Forum, and we'll continue our recap of some of the uh, uh, stakes action yesterday from Gulfstream, including the Fountain of Youth and the Devona Dale. All of that coming up. Stay tuned. It may be cold in the Northeast, but in South Florida, the action's hot. This winter, be part of the championship meet at Gulfstream Park, where the fields are deep and the payouts are big. With some of the most competitive turf racing in America, Gulfstream Park is your winter destination for the finest in championship thoroughbred horse racing. And if you're looking for the top jockeys and best trainers, you'll find them all at Gulfstream Park. So play it today. Gulfstream Park. Champions start here. Here in upstate New York, no one provides bettors with more wagering options than Capital OTB. Our network of ranch and easy bet locations stretches from the mid-Hudson Valley all the way to the Canadian border and west to central New York. So whether you need to place a bet, fund your Capital Bets account, or watch the next big race, all the action is just around the corner. A full list of our branch and easy bet locations can be found online at CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB, the better and most convenient choice for wagering in upstate New York. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. You'll get live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, a simple, safe, and secure wagering platform, and best of all, you get track prices. CapitalOTBBet.com. Bet any place, anytime at CapitalOTBBet.com. And be sure to download our new mobile app from the iTunes Store or Google Play. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Sunday morning. Seth Merrill and Sully Crotty. Uh, I didn't mention the uh, top of the show, the promos, and I'm going to keep pushing this because it just kind of went live within the past week or so. Uh, click on the Tourney Bets link uh, on the front of the page of the website, capitalotb.com. We paired up, uh, teamed up with some of the other entities in New York State to offer some tournament play uh, to our players across New York State. Uh, click on the link and you'll see <coughs> a list of... Uh, all the attorneys, I believe there's one available today. Uh, a lot of them are low buy-in. Some of them are free, and uh, there will be the opportunity to win a seat to the NHC during the year as well. Uh, looks like a lot of fun, as I say. Go to the website, capitalotv.com, and click on the Tourney Bets link. And just kind of explore and take a look at some of the tournaments. As I said, there's a list that says what the buy-in is, what kind of a tournament it is, what the prize package could be. Um, you know, take a look, and uh, if you're Capital OTV bet player, jump on and uh, take advantage of some of that tournament action. It should be a lot of fun. All right, 
Let's uh, take a look at some of the action for today and give you some ideas for this afternoon. And we'll start things out a little bit later <laughs> on this afternoon. Actually, uh, kind of early evening our time. Santa Anita's fifth race is the Tis Now. Uh, these are four-year-olds and up going a mile. Sully, what did you see in the Tis Now out of Santa Anita? Yeah, the short field here, and it looks like a you know three competitive horses in this spot. Um, I, I, I went with the three on top, Surfing Star. You get Flavian Pride going a, another route distance here on the main track. But this is a horse that really has stepped it up since breaking the maiden. Ran in a couple state bred optional claimers at Del Mar. Um, went from a 73 buyer up to a 95 and a 96. So those are two really impressive wins last uh, the last two starts. And this horse... Over the over the surface at Santa Anita has three wins in four starts and it's running the money every single time. So, um, you know, right now it's the second choice. You could definitely see this one going off as the favorite. Uh, I'm going to try to split the two short prices here. Shades of Victory of 15 to one has some early speed as well, so maybe it can be interesting in this spot to perhaps split. Um, the four, uh, the three and the four here. The Shades of Victory has gotten to the lead in a couple of these stakes races, has been competitive in some of those stakes races, but has some really nice workouts heading into this one. February 20th, a nice bullet um, out of town, and then uh, over the surface, this horse has been competitive against some quality horses, so uh, I'll use Shades of Victory with some speed switching barns here. <clears throat> excuse me, in the second spot. And then the four is Edwards going left. John Sadler and Joel Rosario back in California after uh, his day in South Florida yesterday. A horse that lost by a length to Axeman, who's a really nice runner. That was in an optional claimer sprinting. They're going to stretch this horse back out. Went a mile distance at Los Al and lost by, um, lost by a neck two shades of victory, the number five horse. So um, on the stretch out, a little bit short of a price for me. I'm going to use a horse that has proven um, that they could go two turns and at Santa Anita it's ran well the last two starts at this distance. So uh, I'm going to use the three on top. In the fifth at Santa Anita, the Tis now went three, five, and four. So that's going to take a look at a couple races in New York, starting with race two. Race two at Aqueduct is a state bred maiden, uh, state bred maiden claimer going at six furlongs. Yeah, and it just thought I'd stick this one in, you know, second leg of the pick five, uh, the first leg of the early pick four. Uh, I have it one, seven, four, and five. Blue skies forever. Uh, I on the morning line, second choice. We'll see. We get three to one on the morning line. I'll be interested to see if that holds up because, as I said earlier, uh, betters like the buyer numbers. I use them as a tool too. And I think off the recent buyers, this horse is absolutely live in here. Maybe has an edge on this bunch a little bit. The morning line favorite of five to do Teresa's boy. I, clearly, buyer-wise, is, is kind of chasing the top pick, Blue Skies Forever. So I thought, you know, maybe maybe if the betting public buys into the morning line or, or agrees with the morning line odds maker, uh, maybe we get a little bit of value on Blue Skies Forever. Rodolfo I had in the second spot off the number fired last time, which was a little bit of an aberration. But sometimes these kind of long-time maidens just start to figure it out and improve a little bit. I'll see if Gary Siaka has turned that one uh, around. But uh, uh, again, off that last number, I'll toss that one in at a seven to two morning line. And uh, actually, Noble Behavior is the, the nine to five morning line favorite, not uh, Teresa's Boy. Teresa's Boy second, uh, and my Blue Sky Forever third. But even Noble Behavior, I you know you go two back in a, a number that is kind of comparable with Blue Skies Forever, the last number not so much. So again, I think Blue Skies Forever has a numbers edge on Noble Behavior as well. Now Noble Behavior a little more lightly raced, and maybe off the last two you can kind of like Rodolfo think eh, the horse is kind of figuring out figuring it out and has maybe a little more upside potential in Blue Skies Forever. But I just think off the past couple of starts we've seen Blue Skies Forever pair up a couple of numbers that, as I say, I think have a little bit of an edge on this field. We'll find out a little bit more this afternoon. I have it one, seven, four, and 5, but I'll also toss out, don't sleep on soup, baby, the 20 to 1 shot from Robbie Davis, because sometimes Barnes can get hot, and Robbie the other day, double and green, gets it done at a 35 to 1 mutual, winning uh, down at Aqueduct, I think it was on Friday, uh, yeah, March 1st, I have the chart right there, gets it done. 
like Secretariat at 35 to 1. What up by seven lengths the Robbie Davis train is. They say sometimes barn can get a little hot and Robbie has a uh, soup baby uh, in here. I couldn't pull the trigger, but uh, and I think you're going to get that price, but it'd be interesting to see if Robbie could get a couple of uh, nice uh, long price runners to, to do a little something uh, over the weekend. All right, let's move on to uh, race number five at Aqueduct, the fifth race this afternoon at Aqueduct. We'll both take a look at this one. I have a little meeting of the minds on this uh, state bred maiden special weight event. Five and a half furlongs the trip. Sully, your thoughts the Aqueduct fifth? Uh, I went five, seven, four, and six. And the fifth at Aqueduct, some local connections here with the number five. So good luck to all of them. Um, second time starter here for Linda Rice. Manny Franco will be in the irons. Uh, and, and Linda, you know, the, she's on flyer down there, 26% winning percentage, 35 wins, is running the money well over 50%. Uh, Linda with the second starts is 34%, which is a, a fantastic number. A horse that has been working out well at Belmont. Uh, and the jockey trainer combination is winning at a 26%. So uh, Linda, the second time, uh, the second uh, starter in a state bred main special weight, the numbers are great as well. So I'm going to use some speed here. This horse does have some speed in the work. So we'll use first forever in the local connections again uh, with the number five. So good luck to them. Uh, the number seven in the second spot, this is another Linda Rice trainee horse. Uh, Jose Lascano is going to be in the irons. And this one has some decent works as well. Some better than other, others. Did have a nice bullet workout at Belmont in November. Uh, but in January, had some decent works, including the, um, January 3rd. I thought it was a nice work, a 49-3 and three breezing. That was a 20, uh, 20 rank there. And then some of these works as well do stand out earlier in October and then in November as well. Linda, first time out was a 13%. As I said, much better the second time out. But the sprint numbers first time out are fantastic as well. 26% sprinting for the first time. And then the number four horse is look both ways to get Kendrick Carmooch back in the irons. Good to see him in the winner circle several times and being competitive in some races in New York coming in. Um, after his injury at Kentucky Downs over the fall. But going out for Flying Peace Stables, you get Bruce Levine uh, training a horse that was bought for $75,000 in August of 2017. And this horse does have some decent works as well. I'm just trying to get a little bit of a price. I think this horse could float up a little bit on the on the odds board. Uh, but then again, this is a horse that has some decent works. Kendrick Carmooch, again, he's back in the irons. Bruce Levine has been running in the money a ton at Aqueduct. So we'll use the 4-1 to price in the third spot. In the fifth at Aqueduct, I went 5-7. Four and six. I went one, seven, three, and five. I put Dublin or nothing on top because Dublin's interesting to me as maybe a, a win early type of uh, uh, sire. And, and I just find it interesting. Uh, this horse has been based at Penn National, but obviously as a New York bred, hey, let's go over to, to uh, Aqueduct and, and shoot for $60,000 in the career debut. There are some workouts that are okay underneath. Brings Jackie Davis uh, in for the ride. A, a trainer not necessarily known with a limited sample to get the first timers ready. But again, clearly they're, they're looking to, to get something done on the move to New York in the career debut. With the sire and, and the, the scenario, I just thought Dublin or nothing may be a little bit interesting in here at a little bit of a price, 15 to 1 on the morning line. And, and I think some value will hold up if the horse takes some action. That may, may be some indication that uh, really is live. But I think the price will probably hold up being the out-of-towner. And again, there are some workouts underneath that are okay, but they don't jump off the page uh, by any means. But I think Dublin or nothing is going to be maybe a little bit interesting in here. I went to Zippy on the outside in the second spot by City Zip, uh, trained by Linda Rice. So there's the nature and nurture factor for me, City Zip. Another sire I like uh, for win early type runners, and certainly Linda Rice can absolutely have them ready. Third spot, I used Queendom, another first time starter. I looked at that January 27th workout, which I thought was maybe tipping their hand a little bit. Uh, it was the best of 24 in a 35 and one. And, and in this type of a field, you know, state bred maiden specials uh, that is not, as I say, anything jumping off the page as being superstars, when you can get a, a workout like that, a 35 and change, but more importantly, a best of 24 says that eh, maybe this horse has a little something. 10 to 1 on the morning line, so maybe we'll get something uh, there and first forever in the uh, fourth spot for me, another Linda Rice trainee. The five horse uh, had a career debut that was okay. Linda's horses tend to improve second time out. Boy, we saw that yesterday. Andy uh, kind of pointed out, I think it was the opener 
maybe the second race. She had a first time starter that kind of had tossed a dud in uh, earlier and going off at nine to one. And Andy said, don't let the, don't let a $20 second time starter from Linda Rice get by you. And sure enough, ran very, very well. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a similar kind of a situation from first forever with improvement shown in the second career start. Uh, in the uh, fifth at Aqueduct, for me, one, seven, three, and five. Uh, let's move on now to Gulfstream Park and the uh, 11th race at Gulfstream. Philly and Mayor Allowance, uh, they'll go a mile on the turf. Yeah, an interesting deep field here. I, I went three, eight, uh, four, and five. I thought the nine was very, very interesting. So if you're playing some of these late races, uh, the late pick three, late pick four, I, I think the nine is, is kind of a must use as well, 12 to one. But I went with the three on top. Uh, that is Salsa, Bella, Mike Dub, Madigan Stables, Jorge Abreu, Irad Ortiz, so a lot of connect, good connections there. Horse was in the Chad Brown barn, now in the Jorge Abreu barn, uh, and we haven't seen this horse since May at Belmont. Ran in a really nice optional claimer uh, at Belmont in May. Lost to a nice horse in Pongton before that, ran in a couple uh, graded stakes races at Tampa Bay and at Gulfstream. So I'm going to use Salsa Bella trying to get back to some of those races uh, at Tampa and Gulfstream. The horse was competitive in stakes races, went to Belmont, as I said, nine winners of one. Optional claimer, a really nice field there, was pretty wide. So off the layoff, I'll use this horse on top. In the second spot, I went with the number eight. That is Beach Waltz, uh, Ken and Sarah Ramsey own, Mike Maker, Tyler Gaffleon. Really nice connections. I won a ton of races together uh, with those three. And a horse that I thought two, uh, three back, Ran a really nice race in Indiana Grand. Went to Keeneland. Um, you know, really tough place to wire fields at Ke um, to win off the pace is Keeneland. So, you know, I'm, I'm not holding anything back there from that horse. We're going from a $200,000 race to a grade three at Keeneland against some really nice horses, including Cool Beans, who ran well. Uh, again, the next time out. So I like this horse for course angle as well. Three for three over the surface, three for four in the money, and a horse that should be forwardly placed but can make up some ground off the pace as well as Beach Waltz and then the four horse in the third spot. Seven to two in the morning line, Clarevich, Chad, and Javier teaming up, a horse that's coming in from a statement optional claiming 16 and won that race pretty impressively. So could have won that race by more than two. Uh, I think this is a nice spot here, Chad. Um, again, a fantastic meet in Florida, 29% winning percentage there. Javier had a 20% winning percentage on a horse that should be sitting off the pace as well. So we use a closer and two horses sitting off the pace. There is a lot of speed uh, in this race, and they're all big prices. So we should be off the pace uh, and running down some of these bigger prices speeds. So uh, for me in the 11th at Gulfstream, I went 3, 8, 4, and 5. And then Seth's going to look at one more in New York. The eighth race at Aqueduct is an allowance nine winners of one other than going at seven furlongs. One, two, eight, and five for me. Uh, the one science fiction goes out for Rob Atras, who continues to uh, hit at a high, high percentage. This one coming off a couple of wins in a 40 conditional and a starter allowance at the 50 level. I think is going to fit in very nicely at this allowance nine winners of one other than, particularly with Three wins already under the belt, but the last couple being uh, with buyer numbers that stack up nicely with this group, the high percentage trainer as well. So the check marks again in all the right columns. Summer Punch in the second spot. Dylan Davis on board. He's having a pretty nice season down there. Uh, this one also, if you look at the buyer numbers over the past three starts, stacks up nicely with the top pick. One, two, and three starts back. Moved into this company last time. Ran an okay third. You know, was well beaten, but was clear of the fourth place horse in a six horse field. And, and again, with a number that stacks up with the top pick. So I think belongs. When I get do got down to the uh, third and fourth spots, I kind of juggled around. I originally had Aunt Babe in the mix, and that one certainly scares me. But I wound up using Gypsy Janie and No Deal. Uh, Gypsy Janie, uh, two starts back, ran a number that certainly fits with this bunch and maybe makes this horse to beat if we get back to that number. But the follow-up in similar company went in the wrong direction. So I was a little bit, as I say, when I got down to these last few, I didn't have as much confidence as I did on my top two. No Deal in the uh, fourth spot. A uh, nice series of improving buyers, and given that, you would have to think the possibility is right there to either match up or possibly improve, which may make this horse 
uh, the one to beat if we continue with that improvement on the numbers and can get close to that last number in particular. So I think this one interesting as well. The numbers a little bit lighter maybe for Ant Bay, but they're improving. And, and so there was some upside potential there as well. And I originally had that one in just at the bottom and then changed around. So as I say, the top two I feel a little more confident in. The bottom two uh, I'm not as strong on, although I think on a best effort they could get up there and potentially uh, win the race. Uh, one sheet today, I'm pretty sure uh, the triple uh, box was my play of the day because I had a couple that I had written down, but I think I made the uh, 1285 box the play of the day on the, uh, the sheet available on the website. Click on the Handicapper Support link and check it out. Race number eight at Aqueduct. All right, uh, just before we go to a break, uh, the leaderboard uh, was updated last night for uh, the Kentucky uh, Derby uh, point system. There's a couple in here you would have to think Sully uh, are, are in already, given historically what we've seen. But the points leader right now is War of Will with 60. Mm -hmm. You have to think 60 is going to yeah. get you in. It seems yeah. like if you look historically, the you know number 19 and 20, 18, 19, 20 are in that maybe 25 to 30 point range um, but 60 points uh, you would have to think gets you in code of honor after yesterday's victory with 54 game winner after the the breeders cup juvenile winner last year uh, is sitting at number three with 30 that maybe is uh, you're on the bubble uh, mm -hmm. but game winner comes back uh, next weekend and we'll see if he can add some points bourbon war after yesterday's performance fourth at 21. Uh, some of the horses <coughs> that definitely will need some points. Harvey Wallbanger has 10. Vacoma, and we'll talk with Mike Welch in just a couple of minutes. I thought Vacoma ran nice mm -hmm. uh, yesterday in the seasonal debut, picked up 10 points. Uh, there are other horses. Hidden Scroll, obviously, is chasing after yesterday with only five points. Uh, next weekend, again, it'll be a big weekend out in Southern California. Uh, and the Gotham with Instagram yeah. will be uh, interesting. Those are 50-point races. Tampa Bay Derby next weekend, 50 points. Uh, the uh, Jeff Ruby Stakes out at Turfway, uh, worth uh, 20 points, actually. Uh, downgrade a little bit on the synthetic side of things. We move up to 100-point races March 23rd with the Louisiana Derby, and that'll include the Louisiana Derby, the UAE Derby, the Florida Derby, the Wood Memorial, the Bluegrass, and the Santa Anita Derby, uh, and the Arkansas Derby all be, be worth 100 points. So there's still plenty of points yeah, yeah. up for grabs for uh, the horses that are out there chasing. All right, we will take a break. As promised, we'll be joined by Mike Welch in just a couple of minutes, Daily Racing Forum correspondent for Racing at Gulfstream. We'll get some of his thoughts on the stakes action from yesterday as well. Please stay tuned. The road to the Kentucky Derby ends with the most exciting two minutes in racing, but getting there begins long before then. With 34 prep races that span 15 tracks, the best place to watch, wager, and win is Capital OTB and OTB TV. Upcoming Derby prep races include the Gotham from Aqueduct, the Tampa Bay Derby, and the San Felipe from Santa Anita. So for in-depth coverage and expert analysis of all the Derby prep races, stay with Capital OTB and OTB TV. What if there was a way to become a better horse player, to have a better knowledge of the game, to be more successful? What if there were a way to take what you've learned, what you know, and make better decisions, better choices, to know how to connect the dots? In horse racing, knowledge is a powerful tool, but not the only tool. Race results and replays, past performances and live streaming, wagering from all your digital devices, these two are important tools, and you'll find them all right here at Capital OTB. Capital OTB. Become a better horse player. Come on! I want sales reports on my desk by Monday. Whoops. My bad. Love racing? RTN brings you every live simulcast on your home television, plus live video streaming and race replays on your PC and mobile devices. To order, visit RTN.TV. RTN, a breed apart. 
Not at the track and not near a computer? No problem. Wager with Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System and you'll never get shut out again. Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System is quick, simple to use, and guarantees your wagers are accurate and placed on time. For more information, visit CapitalOTB.com or call Capital OTB's customer service hotline at 800-292-BETS. Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System. Never get shut out again. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Sunday morning, the day after a huge day at Gulfstream Park. And I thought, who better to reach out and get some opinions from than Mike Welch, the correspondent for the Daily Racing Forum down at Gulfstream. Mike, good morning. Good morning, guys. Uh, you said you were just coming back from the track. Give us a little update. Let us live vicariously. What's the weather like down there, Gulfstream, on a Sunday morning? Well, you probably don't want to hear this, but it's about... Uh... <laughs> It's sunny and about 80 yeah, you're right. right now. It actually feels like the summer here. That we were commenting how warm it is up on, we're up on the roof when we clock, and it, it gets gets a little warm up there. So I'm, I'm complaining about the weather. It's too hot. So. Uh, yeah, you're right. We didn't want to hear that. So, uh, all right, let's jump in. We have a few uh, stakes. Uh, we watched some of them earlier uh, in the show. We watched some of the stakes, and we have a few more to cover. And let's jump right in with the highlight, the Fountain of Youth. Uh, and, and, Mike, I've been saying it for a few weeks now, and this kind of, just kind of continues the trend. Other than Will of War, it seems a lot like last year, where we come into a stakes race and a horse has had a good performance a few weeks before and, and is looking to validate, and it doesn't get done, and somebody else jumps up and, and becomes the horse to watch. And that was the factor yesterday as Code of Honor, the number one horse, rebounded for Shug. Nice-looking win for Code of Honor at 9-1. to one. Bourbon War runs second for uh, Mark Hennig. I thought Vacoman in the seasonal debut, the number five horse, was a good third, but Hidden Scroll at six to five, yeah, I think Bill Mott was a little upset maybe with the early fractions, but Hidden Scroll, uh, just fourth place uh, as the uh, best uh, uh, performance there. Uh, a little bit of a disappointment for the six to five favorite. What, do you, what are your thoughts for the uh, Fountain of Youth? Well, first of all, I thought he was a little over bat, you know. I mean, like, people see that 104 fire speed figure and 14 length win. But, you know, he was asked, being asked to do a whole lot more yesterday than he had done in the race before. It was a fast track. It was seasoned horses. It was two turns. And then the possibility that, you know, he might not be on the lead or wind up in a duel for the lead. I mean, it was obvious that the three horse was going to go to the front. So I was a little surprised that Joel went out after him and didn't you know i know he had to use him a little bit to make sure with that short run to the first turn that you get some position there and you don't get trapped out wide but once he he got into that position he, he really really should have uh, eased him back let the other horse go on i mean he's not going to be a factor you know even if he gets loose on an easy lead and you know i thought his, his judgment there was uh you know was ill uh, ill fated obviously and you know everything considered i mean considering what he went through in the fraction duel to get only get beat two and a half or three lanes, it, it wasn't really a bad performance for him. Second time in his career, first time around two turns. But he's a lightly raced horse, and at this stage, you know, I, I don't think he needed to do that uh, if he's going to try to make the, the the derby feel. So it'll be interesting to see if Bill chooses to go on to him, you know, run him in the Florida Derby or give him an extra week and run him in one of the other preps, or if they just kind of back off now and. And uh, say, look, this horse is too nice to rush. And we'll we'll see what happens there. But yeah, Code of Honor was terrific. I mean, he needed to uh, bounce back. I, you know, there was no visible excuse for his poor performance in a mutual macho man. Even Shug really didn't have an answer for it, other than he thought he didn't, you know, have him maybe uh, cranked up enough. But he was too easy on him going in, so he cranked him up a lot more for this one. And you know, the pace scenario obviously was a big plus for him. Uh, but he delivered the performance. So. Um, you know, thumbs up there. We always thought this horse had a lot of ability, and, uh, you know, he validated that yesterday. And uh, Bourbon War, I liked him going in. He was my pick. I thought Irod got him back a little bit too far, left a little too much to do, and came a little bit wide into the stretch. And I think he, even he was kicking himself a little bit after the race for uh, it wasn't one of his best rides. But I thought Bourbon, Bourbon War equated himself really well. And, uh, We'll, we'll see a lot more of him. He, he's, a, he's a really nice horse. It looks like you know, he'll go on further if he has to. Just a question now. My guess is both these horses will come back at the Florida Derby, but the connections both leaving open the possibility that they could wait another week and go to the wood as well. 
What was your takeaway for Vacoma? Because I had that one on top, and I think anybody like me who liked the horse, for me, that was the kind of performance. Uh, I, I not making any decisions. I thought it was pretty good given the time off since the early November win in the Nashua, and first time around two turns. Uh, I thought the third place finish was an okay start to the three year old season. Yeah, no, I thought it was a good performance for him. You know, the, my main concern with Vacoma, you know, he was lightly raised as a two year old. And watching him train, he doesn't have the prettiest action in the world. And I'm not, just not sure there are not some, you know, little bagging issues that he's got. Okay. Uh, but George did a great job with him. He had him ready to run a big race off the bench. I thought he was being asked to do a lot in that spot coming off the layoff and going two turns for the first time. And he actually produced a, a pretty strong effort. So I'm not sure, you know, what those connections are, are talking about doing with him. He could certainly come back at the in the Florida Derby as well, which would which would make for a, a pretty good group. I mean, and if, if Bill decides with Hidden Scroll to do it again here, then, you know, a rematch of that race yesterday without, you know, that kind of silliness of uh, the 99-1 to one shot that kind of ruins the race for everybody, uh, especially for Bill Mott, obviously. Um, you know, it'll be fun to see them all come back against each other again under maybe different circumstances. All right, let's go on to the uh, Philly side because uh... – you know, I, I guess it what, 9-1 to one, you would consider Code of Honor a minor upset in the Florida Derby, but a more potent upset in the Devona Dale. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, stretch run. Jeltrin uh, at 51-1 to one gets it done under Luis Saez. Cookie Dough, the number two, runs second. Champagne, anyone, the number five, runs third. But notably, at 1-5, to five, Jaywalk runs fourth in here under Joel Rosario. So a tough day for a Rosario. But I have to think that this was, you know, we talked about it yesterday on the handicapping show. This was like the single everybody was going to use in the Rainbow Six. You had to feel like Jaywalk was just a walkover. And it wasn't so much she was invincible. Obviously, being the champion from last year, she was talented. But it just looked like the horses, uh, the rest of the field was a little bit weak. Given that, we just watched the stretch run. Jaywalk coming into the stretch offers nothing. But I, what I found interesting when I read your, uh, your recap in the daily racing form, I was kind of shocked that uh, trainer John Service seemed a little nonplussed with the fourth place finish. Well, I mean, you know, there's a couple of ways you could handle that after the race. And, and handling it the way he did, at least at that point, was probably the way to do it. What are you going to say? Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. he said he was disappointed. He, you know, he expected to win. He thought he was going to win. He wanted to win. But that is, you know, that being said, it's not her main goal. I don't think not winning that race is is, is as big a deal as the poor performance. You know, you got to go back and, and wonder what's going on there. And I, I'm going to give him a call as soon as I get off the air here to make sure she come back okay. I mean, he said right after the race she seemed fine, but you never know till the next day sometimes if there's some nagging issues. He just thought that, you know, maybe he didn't have her cranked up enough. I thought, you know, thought myself, even if she was 90%, she was going to beat that bunch, you know, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the horse, the horse that won the race. I mean, I watched her work out of the watched her work out of the gate here last week, and she got beat about ten lengths by a horse that's never started before. So, <laughs> and it was just a it was just a poor effort all the way around, you know. So uh, it was hard to make that horse. Cookie Dough, we did have working very well, and uh, I thought, you know, once she put Jay Walk away, she was going to win, um, and uh, and she got caught by a horse that. Uh, you know, seems inferior to her. But, again, then there is a fitness issue. I mean, Cookie Dough hasn't run, hadn't run since September. The other horse had been running. But even still, uh, it, it was pretty hard to, uh, to fathom that result. Even if you were against Jaywalk, I could see guys, you know, taking that race. And, you know, if you think you could beat Jaywalk, wheeling but leaving out the horse that won, just because <laughs> she's the most improbable one of them all. So, obviously, the big news, you know, besides the, you know, the big payoff and, and that kind of an upset is, is, is they walk okay. And, uh, you know, I guess we'll know more in the next, uh, hopefully in the next few minutes, but uh, if not in the next couple of days as, as she uh, comes out of the race. But he said if everything goes well, it's going to stick on course. The Kentucky Oaks is still his goal, and she'll come back here either in the Gulfstream Park Oaks or he'll take it at Keeneland for the Ashland. Can people check uh, your Twitter feed or look for the article on the follow-up to your phone call to service? Yeah, I'll have something on there a little later this morning. Very good. All right. If especially if there's anything really negative. Sure. You know, yeah. I mean, if there's no change from what he told me yesterday, you know, I'm going to write something. But, 
if, if there's some news out of there that's uh, disconcerting in some way with her physically, then uh, that'll go up right away. All right, let's go a little earlier. Subdivision I really like is three-year-olds on the turf, and that was the Palm Beach yesterday. Mylon 16th on the grass for the three-year-olds. The uh, big favorite uh, was uh, a thread of blue at one to two for Kieran, uh, coming out of a couple of wins, including a nice win in the Dania Beach in the uh, most recent effort. A thread of blue is going to be the number five horse here and gets it done. Casa Creed is a horse I liked on the move to the turf, too, back in the 12 to one win, was nice in the Kitten's Joy. Kind of a head scratching sixth in the uh, Dania Beach, however, behind a thread of blue but bounced back nicely yesterday and, and really threatened in the stretch. I thought Casa Creed might go by, but it was a game effort from a threat of blue. So the lean Einsiedler horse uh, and Bill Mott, Casa Creed, a good second, and then a little further back to louder than bombs. But again, in a subdivision I like, I suppose if you were rating that subdivision of three-year-olds on the turf, a threat of blue might be right at the top of the class at this point. Yeah, he impressed me actually more winning that race yesterday than he did the time before, because the time before they just let him blow along on an easy lead. And he had everything his own way, and that was one of the reasons the horses behind him really had no chance because of the pace scenario. Now, yesterday, again, you had some silly horse in there that helped uh, create a, a, a different kind of pace scenario. But Threader Blue was able to rate and, you know, run from off the pace and win. So that shows you something, and I'm sure Kieran was happy to see that because as he goes forward, you know, those situations may present itself again where he's going to have to, you know, not – get loose on the lead and, and, and run from off the pace. So in that regard, I thought it was a, a pretty good performance by him. I, you know, obviously he's the best of that bunch. and You know, we'll see what happens when he moves on next, uh, if, he, if he faces a little tougher next time. And uh, finally, let's take a look at the Canadian turf, a mile on the grass for uh, the older horses. The big favorite in here was breaking the rules for Shug with Irod on board. Three to five favorite. Number seven, breaking the rules. We're one second, though, to the Bill Mott runner, uh, Krampus. Krampus last time had thrown in a little bit of a dud in the El Prado, running fifth. Right before that, had run third in an optional claimer. Uh, but the buyer numbers were uh, pretty competitive. Uh, again, though, breaking the rules, coming in off a couple of stakes races, including ending the three-year-old season with a win in the Tropical Park Derby, was the favorite. But it was a nice ding-dong battle down the stretch with uh, Krampus winding up holding on by a head in a gutsy performance over breaking the rules. Well, actually, Krampus didn't throw in a dud in the El Prado. He was going to be second, I think, in that race. He got stopped uh, stone cold okay. uh, trying to come between horses in late stretch. I, I don't think he would have beat the winner. But uh, I know a lot of trip players were sitting and waiting on this horse. I just didn't think he was good enough um, to beat, beat a horse like breaking the rules. And, uh, you know, but, but Bill said after the race that once his, this horse his, gets in front, he's as game as they come, and he's tough to get by, and he proved that. You know, breaking the rules looked like he had a measure and uh, couldn't get by him. So uh, a great ride by Johnny V. You know, big rider change there from uh, Manny Cruz to Johnny V. He was riding terrific right now. And, um, you know, it was a good day for Johnny, you know, yeah. with Code of Honor also. But um, now I could have seen him in there, but I, I, I just thought breaking the rules was a, a notch above those. You look like something special and a horse that was, you know, improving with every start. And I haven't seen the buyer numbers. I mean, he might have run the same buyer he ran last time, but just got beat by a horse that got a crafty ride, and it's a game as can be. Yeah, it was, it was a very game performance. Uh, Mike, before we let you go, you've alluded to it already. Again, alert people to uh, the workout report if they want to take advantage of that. Excuse me? I'm sorry. I uh, just just a, a alert people to the uh, workout report if people want to take advantage of that. Yeah, you know, you can still buy it on a daily or a weekly basis. and It's on drf.com slash clocker, or you can go to the homepage, I think, and find it. And, uh, you know, we have four weeks to go, and we've had some pretty good success with it so far. You know, one horse in, in one day could, will pay for the, you know, the whole meet sometimes. So, um, you know, we'll be at it until the end of the meet. And then after the meet, I'm not sure, maybe we'll do a couple of weekends. Or, or I, will, I believe we're going to have Keeneland, too, which with, with a lot of the horses that are leaving here going to Keeneland. So, um, you know, there's still a lot more to, more to come there. So, uh, yeah, I, I think people should at least check it out and see. It's not, uh, you know, it, it, it's nothing is that's in stone with these workouts, but... Uh, Every once in a while, you find some hidden gems there. Yeah, we've seen that up at Saratoga, certainly with your workout reports up there, and so highly recommended uh, for the Gulfstream Park meet as well. Mike, as always, appreciate the visit and the time, and we'll talk again.
Okay, guys. Enjoy the weather. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, Mike Welts from uh, the Daily Racing Forum. Again, you saw his Twitter feed there. You can always check that out, but I'll also uh, check out his work in the Daily Racing Forum. And again, uh, try out the, the workout reports as well. They do a great job up at Saratoga. There are every season some nice gems uh, on that, and you'll find those down at Gulfstream as well. All right, uh, time to wrap things up. Do want to remind you that the $100 win bet contest today here at the Clubhouse Racebook. That promotion is available here at 7-Eleven Central Avenue in Albany. Love to see you down here this afternoon. So, as I said, there was a nice crowd in here yesterday for, yeah, for a yeah. great day of racing. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll see if, how the crowd comes for the Winnebec contest. I know last week there was a very good crowd for the Winnebec contest. And so, um, and then with a card like that uh, at Gulfstream, you know, you're, you're going to draw a crowd. So, and, you know, as you said, it's just the, the cards are going to keep progressing at different venues. And next week, big one out in California. Yeah, Tampa next, Bay's got a huge yeah, card next, as well. Next so. week on the three-year-old scene is very, very uh, intriguing. But a win-to-bet contest today, 1% bonus on your Aqueduct bets. Uh, the rules and restrictions on that are available at CapitalOTB.com. And again, I remind you to check out the Tourney Bets link. That's uh, you know just been up for the last week or so. Do want to keep promoting that because... Uh, I say it all the time, tournament play is a lot of fun, makes you think a little bit differently. I think it helps your handicapping, but also you can wind up with some nice prize money as well. So check out the Tourney Bets link on the front page of CapitalOTB.com. Thanks to our friends at Gulfstream for their sponsorship. Gulfstream Park, champions start here. We'll see if that, if that uh, applies to Code of Honor. <laughs> and, and again, I, I've been saying it now for a few weeks. It's a lot like last year where they just, uh, they're just they rotating. And mm-hmm. War of Will is strung a couple together. But Code of Honor, now now we're sitting and seeing, mm-hmm. can he string a couple together? What's he do next time? Mm-hmm. Because we were waiting for him to validate himself last time in the Mucho Macho Man. He didn't. But now we've kind of gotten some of that validation. But I think he has to put another one together. I, I, you know, I, I definitely think he does. And Mike kind of talked about it. You know, the pace was just perfect for, for Code of Honor, that type of race he runs. So. And there are some other big names that... Potentially could go to the Florida Derby, you know, promised to fulfill one last year uh, and ran suicidal fractions in the Florida yeah. Derby. So we'll see what happens later on in, in this month. But should be a really nice field and they're going to be interesting to see again what Hidden Scroll does. I know Bill's got another really nice horse in, in Country House who ran second in the Risen Star. So we'll see what happens there. Maybe potentially the Louisiana Derby for that horse. But um, I, I wouldn't be worried if I was Belmont. He's got a couple of nice cards there. Uh, a couple of nice horses there to play wherever he feels is necessary. Yeah, we'll see what Kenny McKee can do with Harvey yeah. Wallbanger. Signalman, Signalman was, was yeah. not uh, no. impressive yesterday. Signalman, I thought, was going to offer up a little bit more uh, than that. So we'll see where they go with that one. And next week, of course, we'll see if some of the top two-year-olds can validate. And they then become players. Game winner on Instagram yeah. Uh, yeah. next week. We'll see what uh, they can do. Sully, good luck today. And good luck to you. And uh, good luck to all of you. I'll be back in a little over an hour or so with OTB Live for Sunday afternoon. We'll see you then. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting. Bit bet into that.